let's uh, let's get into it. So um, last time we talked about um, walking. So we did. Uh, uh, it's a little bit of history and kind of like kind of what the modern MPC control stack looks like on quadrupeds and stuff like this. And today we're going to kind of do the last one of these little case study things. Um, and so it's it's kind of driving. So the tongue in cheek title is how to drive a car. And so we'll go through the basic kind of MPC formulation dynamics models that people use for like kind of standard, um, what's kind of the standard thing in industry right now, more or less on the control side. Um, and then I'm also gonna talk about some like more kind of recent research stuff, which is sort of um, game theoretic uh, uh, MPC or control or whatever you wanna call it, which is some, some work in my, my lab uh, last year that is sort of how to deal with uh, the driving problem when you're dealing with other drivers and how to reason about the behaviors of other drivers and like uh, a little bit about like what the frozen robot problem is, if you guys have heard of this. Uh, so a little bit on that, just as a fun kind of thing, hopefully interesting. So that's what today's about. Uh, okay, so start out like a little bit of history on this stuff and where this all started. So um, who like, any guesses on where the like first autonomous driving demos were done? Like how far does this go back? Earlier. Yeah, it turns out the first like sort of hints of autonomous driving happened in the 1920s, like literally a hundred years ago. And so what people were doing originally, uh, there were these, a bunch of schemes for putting like uh, wires in the pavement and using various like really simple electromagnetic schemes for like, uh, following these wires that were embedded in the pavement. So you got rid of, you know, all the challenging perception problems, right? But there's demos actually, really early demos going back to the 20s and 30s. So kind of insane. It's like kind of interesting to look at, at the history of some of these things and how, how old they really are, right? That's like a hundred years ago, people are thinking about autonomous driving. Um, and then the, the first like, you know, recognizably modern stuff that like kind of the current work traces its lineage back to is really in the eighties. Um, and actually some of the very earliest, you know, kind of modern work. Um, and there was stuff in the sixties as well. There was versions of this idea of like burying things in the highway highways that like actually the US Department of Transportation like had some demos where they buried like wires into the pavement and, and did weird things. But in the 80s is when people started doing like the modern autonomous driving stuff with cameras and vision and all the stuff that we recognize today. That's kind of where it all started, like early to mid 80s. And um, there were basically two research groups originally that did it, uh, did this work. One was here at CMU, some of like the very pioneering work in autonomous driving. And the other was a, a group in Germany with like Mercedes Benz and uh, a couple of universities in Germany. Um, so that's kind of basically everything you see now traces its roots back to that. And um, there were lots of interesting like highway demos in those early days. And like, so another fun fact is like, does anyone know when the first ever autonomous cross country drive was? Take a guess. It's around now, it was like late eighties, early nineties. I think it's a little couple of years after that in the early nineties, there was a group from CMU that drove autonomously from Pittsburgh to California in a van. And they basically, the entire back of the van, like they ripped the seats out and it was just racks of computers in the back. Because with like the early 90s vintage computers, like it took an entire back of a van full of computers to do this stuff. But it was like a basic vision, uh, like all autonomous. They, they managed to do it basically 98% uh, autonomously. So like 2% of the mileage the human driver had to like intervene, but 98% autonomous coast to coast drive in the like early 90s, which is super interesting to me in like the like 
so where are we now versus like 30 years ago right like what's changed and I feel like what this says about driving is that it's one of these like long tail problems where like you know it was 98 percent 30 years ago and we might be at like 99.9 .9 now there's still a huge tail on this distribution right of like weird corner case things and like because of the safety you know demands of driving it's like pretty scary and there's a lot of issues with this but I think it's pretty fascinating like how far this stuff goes back um So like kind of back then they there were all these things with like 95% plus let's say autonomy on like long highway trips. There were similar demos around the same time in Germany like on the autobahn and stuff like that. Um, so that was like 90s a lot of stuff going on and then um, the thing that really kickstarted a lot of the current stuff is the DARPA challenge in the the early 2000s. I was an undergrad when this stuff was happening and I was at Cornell and I remember like Cornell had a big team uh, and MIT had a big team and CMU obviously had a big team that won, right? That Red Wicker led. So this was like all going on as an undergrad. It was super cool. And really basically those DARPA teams like more or less directly ended up uh, as companies that like got founded here and a few other places. Uh, literally, I think Google basically hired Stanford's DARPA challenge team, and that became like what is now. Yeah. So I talked to a Steve professor who said he wouldn't get in a self driving car. So knowing your slice of the problem, how likely would you be to get in a self I mean, I've been in one. Like a level five one. Oh, yeah. No, so like I don't think that exists right now. But when it, when it does. Yeah, I would do it. Okay. I don't know. Depends on your level. But so like, 10 or 20 years from now, like this stuff I think is gonna be there, but right now it's nowhere close. Like for reference, like I have a Tesla and I tried paying for the like, uh, the full self-driving feature, like this past summer, they like let you get it on a monthly subscription plan. So I was going on a bunch of road trips and I was like, yeah, okay, I'll pay 200 bucks and try this, you know, for a month. And it was awful, like <laughs> <laughs> embarrassingly bad and just not even like remotely close to full self-driving. Like it's, it's, yeah. So I don't know. I think like, I wouldn't like, I definitely wouldn't trust my life with the current stuff that exists now. I think like uh, the, these problems are solvable, like these will get better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely super sketchy right now. And the things that are out there on the roads, I would not trust the current stuff, you know? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> uh, yeah, so DARPA Challenge, basically all the current teams, like a bunch of those teams ended up as companies. Yeah. Um, for this uh, 1990s demo, is that like they just went straight from Pittsburgh and then stayed on the highway the whole time? Or I'm assuming they, they, I don't know. Like uh, you could probably ask around here and there's some people here who probably remember this. Uh, I, I really don't know is the honest answer. I don't know if they got off and slept and then kept going or if they just like tag teamed it and somebody slept while somebody else, you know, sat there. I don't know. Yeah, because like I mean, because getting off the highway and driving to your hotel is probably not something they did autonomously. Yeah, yeah. I really don't know the details of this. Then presumably they also had to buy gas. So yeah. they would have had to have like gotten off at some point to like do some of this. But the the apparently they achieved 98 percent of the miles autonomously so maybe the two percent accounts for some of that but yeah i don't know okay. uh there's papers on this there's a bunch of like you know 90s vintage like tech magazine you know archives you can find online about this and what's that there's yeah there's definitely videos yeah there's uh and i'm sure again there's people here who were here back then who you could ask yeah like red would almost certainly know <laughs> yeah. Okay. Red's an awesome dude, though. He's amazing and has really good stories. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So I would say, like, this basically, I would say most of the current stuff traces its roots back to this DARPA challenge era. Like, a lot of the people who are currently like leading companies and stuff were involved in that. And um, yeah.
but I guess the point is, yeah, in spite of like how, you know, current this is, like it has deep roots that go back, like in some ways a century. And then like, you know, kind of very much like all the current stuff really goes back to the kind of early mid eighties with work that was here and a couple other places. Okay, cool. So historical overview. Next, this kind of like full stack picture. And we're gonna we're gonna focus on the control side of this. Arguably, that's not the hard part. Uh, I would say definitely that's not the hard part. There are some hard parts there, but really the the perception, like vision, et cetera, part of this problem is where the really like difficult challenges are. So that said, we're going to ignore most of that. So there's some perception, you know, state estimation stuff. Um, then there's kind of two pieces here. I would say there's this uh, sort of we'll call this there's like a high level planner which is like a route planning which is like graph searchy stuff and then there's a, a low like a kind of more or less standard path planner that's trying to generate obstacle free smooth trajectories and then from there there's generally like an mpc controller that we'll talk about in some detail that's generating that's actually reason about the car dynamics and all this and basically trying to track this uh, path that's coming out of the path planner, all obeying all the constraints. Uh, and then this goes into the car. Uh, and generally, when I say car, uh, usually there's, you know, some details there. There's low level controllers that are, you know, actually generating the torques on the actuators. And then this kind of loops back around, kind of sensors, that sort of thing. So let's talk about each of these a tiny bit. Uh, so the sensors on these things, we all kind of know the story here. Uh, these all have GPS, they have IMUs, uh, cameras, uh, and then often some combination of like LIDAR or radar sensors as well. Although notably not Tesla, as many of you know. Um, and really like, as a controls guy being honest, like the perception problem here is the hard part. Like that's really where the, that's where like 90% of the current challenges are. Maybe, yeah, maybe 80 to 90% of like the current hard stuff is in the perception side. There's a little bit of the control part that's hard that you can argue about whether it's control or what exactly it is. We'll talk about that later. That's a game theoretic part, but most of the control problems are kind of solved and like the stock stuff that we've talked about in this class is actually what the car companies use like more or less they're doing some flavor of ddp or ilqr with a bicycle model uh in their mpc controller that's like what it is uh so we'll, we'll talk about that um okay so what these other blocks are this high level planner thing um this is like the you know the navigation kind of piece right so this is like route planning Uh, with you know various kind of graph searchy techniques so like A star that kind of thing, and this is really generating a set of waypoints. Then at like a slightly lower level, we have this thing that we called like the path planner, and this is generating basically trying to generate smooth like spline curves between waypoints that are collision free. So this is trying to reason a bit about obstacles, um, but it's really just generating a smooth like kinematic path that's not hitting stuff. So in particular, right, there's no dynamics here. And then this, uh, the next piece, these, these guys like now fill into this MPC controller. And that's the part we're gonna talk about mostly. Um, so this is basically taking that spline curve that's supposed to be collision free and all that from the path planner and then tracking it with some kind of vehicle dynamics model and constraints on accelerations and throttle and steering angles and all that kind of stuff.
Okay, so this is yeah where we're going to spend most of our time. Again, not the hard part, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so the lines between these are almost always fuzzy, right? Like, uh, as I've maybe said many times, like the, the difference between planning and control is how fast you can solve the problem. And like, what is now MPC would have been planning 10 years ago, you know, because we couldn't solve those problems fast enough. So yeah, the lines are blurry. And exactly how much of this is MPC and how much of this is path planning is sort of blurry. And there's, you know, you can put things in either block. But usually there's some sort of the reason in this case why you wouldn't put it all in the MPC controller is that uh, the collision avoidance part of this is non-convex usually. So you can imagine if I have a bunch of you know random like obstacles, uh, the the free space is not convex. And when I write those constraints down in my MPC in my trajectory optimization problem, it's going to end up being a non-convex trajectory optimization problem. And those don't necessarily have guaranteed solutions. They definitely don't have unique solutions, right? And they can be kind of hard to solve online. So you can't give nice guarantees about that sort of problem being solvable in real time and not the solver not like sort of barfing at you. So for that reason, this first path planner step, the reason that's there is that's doing some other search style technique to find a collision free path through the environment that avoids hitting stuff or people, pedestrians, other cars. That kind of thing, and then passing that already collision free path to the uh, trajectory optimizer, and therefore giving it already like a nice warm start with a collision free path so that that lower level MPC solver is going to converge very quickly and reliably. Does that make sense? No, I mean, the path planner is not solving the whole problem. The path planner is like finding, literally just finding a smooth collision free path through the environment, right? It doesn't reason about the vehicle dynamics. It's not giving you a control, uh, any controls, right? It's not figuring out what the throttle and steering commands are, any of that, right? It's just giving you this path that doesn't hit stuff. Uh, so it's literally just a, a line drawn through the environment. And then what you can think of is that's basically going in the cost function for the MPC, the MPC is getting a tracking cost on that path, right? Does that make sense? Generally not. Yeah. So this is now called kinodynamic planning. And so the, when I say path planning, often this is either some graph search technique or some kind of random search like RRT style technique. Those, um, you can do some amount of dynamics in there, but usually uh, they don't scale up well to higher dimensional spaces. So usually they're you do just kinematic planning in the lowest dimensional space possible. So here, that's basically the 2D plane that you're driving in. And there, it's very low dimensional. And those techniques are really fast and efficient. So you then take that. Now you take that and you use that in like your cost function and your initial guess in the MPC solver, which is using the full vehicle model and solving for the controls that track that path. Does that make sense? So yeah, in practice, like these techniques get Kind of combined in a ton of ways for like practical reasons like in theory you could like write this all down as one big nonlinear optimization problem like you're saying but and if you're doing this offline at your desk fine go for it but um that problem is a probably gonna it's gonna be slow to solve and it's probably not gonna be super reliable like there are gonna be multiple local optima right especially with collision avoidance kind of constraints like you could drive around the obstacle one way or the other kind of stuff right so it's not a unique solution and it's it's non-convex, so you're not guaranteed to find the solution reliably. Does that make sense? I mean, it's there's sort of part of it is that, but part of it's also like more fundamental. It's the non-convexity of the optimization problem means that like it's I mean, non-convex NLPs are NP hard in general. Like you can't like always solve them. Like what we've kind of seen in this class is you can usually solve them and like with some guessing and checking and like massaging if you're sitting at your desk doing this offline you can almost certainly get a solution but if you're in a car going like 80 miles an hour and there's stuff in front of you that you don't want to hit like you can't necessarily guarantee that that thing's going to converge in 10 milliseconds right and you and you never will be able to in this deeper sense because of the non-convexity of the problem Does that make sense 
The controllers do reason about collisions. Yeah, you, you can definitely put collision constraints in the MPC controller. The reason you don't want to just do it from scratch like that is because of the non-convexity. So what's going on here is the path planner is basically giving the MPC solver a warm start that's collision free. So it's a feasible warm start trajectory. Right? Are there tricks to assuming that MPC controller will do a perfectly track path planner? Are there tricks to not just avoid obstacles but find the yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of heuristics and all kinds of secret sauce tuning games that you can play with all of this stuff. And like you can glue them in together different ways, right? And you can definitely, definitely, there's many, many tricks. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, like usually that MPC controller does have the constraints in it, to be clear. Yeah. 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 In the case where you don't have, like, I'm assuming the height of the turn requires a map. And yeah. in the case where you don't have a map, like, I guess, like, does it all reduce to like the kind of like MPC controller like horizon? Uh, so the the high level planner is definitely doing like a map waypoint thing. The path planner is generally using whatever online information you have, like your lidar, you know, depth map, blah blah blah. That's happening online at like fast rates based on like whatever the horizon you can see with your sensors ahead of you is, right? Uh, I guess so. I guess that's like the like your your uh, time horizon is only go as far as your sensitivity. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, in general. I mean, maybe there's, I don't know, like the details of how people are doing this now so much, but yeah, like you've got whatever sensing information you have and whatever offline map information you have, and you can use all of that theoretically in these planners. But yeah, there's some limit to like your field of view with your sensors and how accurate that is and, and that kind of thing, right? Okay, anybody else? Cool. Okay, so that's like, kind of the stack and what we're going to look at. So a quick look at like uh, vehicle dynamics for cars, like how people model these things. So um, first off, there are many, many options here uh, with like varying levels of fidelity and like, you know, complexity. And generally you want to use the simplest, cheapest one that you can get away with for your problem. So um, along those lines, the maybe most common one is called the um, bicycle or single track model. And there's a few versions of this also. And um, we'll do the simplest one of those. So Here's what that looks like. So here's what's called the kinematic bicycle model. So basically you have like, so let's say we have some 2D world coordinate frame uh, with like an X, Y and a theta. You've got a back tire and a front tire and you have a steering angle that we'll call alpha. Um, this distance between the front and rear axle, we call L. Um, and then we have some velocity here coming from the back tire. I think that's it. So the inputs to this model are uh, V, and alpha, or depending on how you set this up, you can make it alpha dot. And there's maybe some reasons, if you wanna limit the steering rate, the turning rates, you wanna make it alpha dot maybe. And then you assume the tires don't slip. And then you can basically write down the kinematics of this thing. Um, and it's super simple, kind of obvious trig stuff. So you get something like X dot equals V cos theta, y dot equals V sine theta, uh, theta dot equals uh, V tan alpha over L. And then like, if you wanna make alpha dot, you know, uh, the input, this would be like U2 and then your U is gonna be the velocity command and this uh, alpha dot 
steering angle command, steering angle rate command. So this would be like maybe the simplest model you can come up with. Um, so yeah, I should write down the state as well. And so X, your state, this is bad notation. X, Y, theta, sorry, I overloaded the X. The state has the X coordinate, say of the rear axle Y coordinate, and then the angle of the entire car. Um, use some other colors here. This is theta. And then if, yeah, if you do like kind of basic high school trig, you get this kind of thing, right? Um, okay, so this is like maybe the simplest model you can come up with for a car. Uh, this works actually surprisingly well for like normal driving, for like highway driving, this kind of thing. This is pretty good. Uh, when do you think this would break down? When is this a bad model? Yeah. The surface would be flat. Um, I don't think that matters too much. As long as you're dealing with this in the plane of the road, I think that's kind of okay. Gravity would gravity is an external force which are assuming that the surface is flat or not absolute. So that is actually like completely abstracted away here, right? Because that would show up in the accelerations. If you wrote down F equals MA, here I'm assuming I can command a velocity directly, right? So uh, the sort of, so that doesn't show up here. Where it would show up though, is if you were going up a super steep thing and you couldn't command the velocity you wanted because you didn't have enough torque, right? So that's getting at basically where this is gonna start to break down. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Yep. Slip, definitely which you don't want to happen under normal driving circumstances, right? But we'll get to that too. That's complicated. Uh, yeah. The angle of the front wheel being too far, like 180. Yeah, so you can put limits on that though, right? Like in your MPC, you can just put inequality constraints on alpha and say, yeah, this is the max steering angle, right? Um, yeah. Vehicle, if, 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 if vehicle would be yeah, a lot of things can happen. Uh, so, so really, what it, where you kind of we're going with this is it breaks down when you get to like very high acceleration things in general, right? I'm ignoring all of the f equals ma type dynamics here, so we're not reasoning about like limits on the throttle, basically like acceleration limits, right? So, aggressive driving, high accelerations, right, is where this is going to break. So, I, you know, this is assuming I can apply arbitrary velocities to the car instantaneously, which is not true, right? Like. There's acceleration limits, there's turning rate limits, there's tire slip, you know, kind of limits with how much friction you have that limit the. So anytime you start talking about like aggressive driving uh, with high accelerations, high angular accelerations, high linear accelerations, this is gonna start to break because what you're gonna do is try to command velocities here that the vehicle can't actually produce, right? Because it's got acceleration limits. So that's kind of, yeah. So yeah. Okay, so then what do you do? Like more complicated models? Um, what are the kind of options? So the next one up would be the so-called dynamic bicycle model. So this is basically the same picture, but now you actually reason about the the torques and accelerations and forces. So you write down like F equals MA on that model. And now you're actually reasoning about, you know, more of the physics. Uh, so you model the car as a rigid body in 2D. And you write down, you know, kind of X equals MA. Uh, tau equals j omega dot, like the standard stuff. And you're now reasoning about, uh, about like uh, engine torque, uh, and wheel forces, you know, and tire forces explicitly.
So this can handle far more dynamic behaviors, right? You can reason about friction limits with the tires, torque limits, throttle limits with the engine, that kind of stuff, and get most of the effects that we were missing before. And we'll show, show some examples in a little bit of exactly how far you can take this, which is really, really far, it turns out. Like arguably this is all you need. Um, then from here, the next level up would be uh, the so-called double track model. So now this is where you model all four tires and like more or less the full car dynamics. Uh, full like 3D rigid body dynamics. And here you can basically go nuts. You can add like suspension dynamics, transmission dynamics, all that stuff. Um, you can reason now about like uh, body roll, suspension dynamics, that weight transfer between the different tires, right? All that good stuff. Um, so this is like aggressive cornering, right? Where do you think you need this versus like the dynamic bicycle model? Yeah. Pretty much off-road driving, this is like where this starts to really matter. It turns out even on-road racing, this isn't so necessary. Um, but like, uh, yeah, off-road driving, really rough terrain, this stuff will start to matter. What extent do car makers consider the same equipment for the mechanics of their car? Um, I think that these full vehicle models are common in the automotive industry. Like people, like when you're tuning a suspension, for example, like this kind of stuff, I think these do get used for stuff like this, for like designing various aspects of the vehicles. Um, they're not so much used in MPC controllers uh, with some exceptions, like the double track model. Like there are people who are doing that, who are doing crazy off-road driving, crazy aggressive, like drifting stuff, et cetera, et cetera, that gets used. Um, Almost all of the autonomous driving work is using either the kinematic or dynamic bicycle model, though, like pretty much anything you see on an actual car that's like driving on streets under normal circumstances is doing one of those two or some flavor of those. There's some, you know, blurry lines between them. Yeah. So what about for like recovery from sensitive, like hitting a patch of ice? Or something? Yeah, this is really interesting. Did they, did they switch to a more complicated model? Um, so there's been a ton of work on this. And like, if you're interested, in that, I'll show some stuff uh, in a bit on, on some of this. Uh, Chris Gertie's lab at Stanford has done a ton of work on this particular kind of sort of problem. They are using, for the most part, uh, the dynamic bicycle model for almost everything they do. Um, and yeah, you can reason about friction coefficients with the tires and all kinds of stuff like that. And they've done a lot of these kind of like aggressive recovery kind of scenarios where you like your wheels slip on something and what do you do? Uh, so, um, I know they've done it. I don't know the details so much of, of, of a bunch of that stuff, but uh, I'll show you some papers and you can check it out. All right. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it's, it's a lot bigger. The state is bigger uh, and like there's more going on in the dynamics. So um, the optimization problems get bigger and harder to solve basically. Yeah, basically, if you're not doing like crazy off road racing, you don't need it and you probably shouldn't use it because it's more compute and it's you just don't need it. Right. So, yeah, generally speaking, there's like this notion of like in control, you want to use uh, like the cheapest, simplest model that's good enough for the control task. Right. Because uh, adding more model complexity, like it's it makes the problem harder. And if you don't need it, like you, you don't want to use it because it's making your control problem harder. Yeah. So um, in all of these things, there is some like, uh, you need to have accurate parameters for the model. Yeah. Uh, so is there a way to like 
if you don't have backward parameters to like kind of do some sort of like under fitment to do some discrimination to like get those. For sure, yeah. So people do this. Uh, in particular, here the the main unknowns are tire friction coefficients, right? So there's been there's definitely been work on estimating those online, and I've seen some really cool stuff where people actually. Uh, one of my friends at CU Boulder did this thing um, where they put, uh, they embedded like IMUs in the tires themselves and they trained a, a neural network classifier basically to like use the data from these IMUs in the tire to actually infer friction coefficients online for each tire, which I thought was really cool. Uh, so yeah, people have done all kinds of stuff like this. The, actually, the way human drivers do this is super interesting. Uh, there's like uh, Chris Gertie's lab, whose stuff I will show you, who does autonomous racing stuff. They've like done a bunch of uh, racing against pro race car drivers with their stuff. And um, a lot of experiments where they'll like uh, instrument the cars with the human driver uh, and see what they're doing basically and where they're looking and all this kind of stuff. And the results are really interesting. Basically the optimal thing to do, if you're, this gets into like exploitation versus exploration kind of trade-offs, right? So if you know the friction coefficient and you're racing, the optimal thing to do when you're cornering is to go right up to the friction limit, right? And, but not slip. If you slip, you're losing uh, cornering friction, right? You're losing acceleration. So like you don't want to slip. You want to go right up to the edge. So that's what the autonomous car does. So if you have a decent estimate of the friction coefficient, the, car, the autonomous car will go right up to the limit, all exploitation, right? What the human drivers do is totally different strategy. The human driver basically like flirts with that edge constantly and is always like just going over it and then backtracking because they're trying to explore and find where it is all the time while they're driving. Like, so you see the human drivers constantly just passing the, line, the, the friction limits and slipping a little bit and then recovering. And it's so they know, and it, it, the people have like studied this. Basically, um, you can imagine on a racetrack, the friction coefficient varies across the track, right? And it varies with temperature and all this stuff. So um, good professional drivers, actually, they can, you can hear the tire squeal, right? And all this kind of stuff. So they know exactly where it's slipping. And they basically build up a mental map of the track of like friction over the different areas of the track. And they like use this uh, when they're racing. And it turns out like uh, like the best autonomous race car stuff still can't beat a professional human, which is pretty interesting. And like the things they're doing uh, are, are pretty next level. Like all this kind of stuff I just mentioned, they're, they're doing some really crazy stuff. Um, that said, uh, if you wanted to beat a human pro driver now, what you would do is put, uh, give the MPC controller individual uh, throttle and brake control over each wheel. If you did that, a human couldn't just couldn't actuate all of these things and you would win. Uh, so if you gave the, the autonomous car like individual four individual brake inputs and like four individual torque inputs for each tire, you could you could beat the human. Uh, so I don't know, that's kind of fun. So how does that help? Because of if you have this like uh, double track model, when you're cornering, you're loading like the uh, the inside or the outside tires more, right? So they have more downforce, so they can have more friction. So if you differentially brake, you can actually get more net uh, like force out by applying more torque to the tires that have more weight on them and stuff, right? And a human just can't do this because you only have three inputs, right? So so that's how you would win if you were if you wanted to beat a human professional driver now. Anyway, uh, okay, so double track. Oh yeah, then like the um, the really crazy stuff here where like kind of like we were talking about tire models and friction models are where it gets really complicated. So. So like what we just talked about with the kinematic model, you're like, that's super simple. So that's basically just assuming no slip. Uh, the next one, um, so like, um, so we'd say like medium complexity maybe would be like Coulomb friction. Um, to like super complicated. Uh, so they're like super sophisticated, nonlinear hysteretic tire friction models that reason about like the size of a contact patch and the normal force and all kinds of stuff. So, 
So, yeah. Okay, so that's modeling cars. Um, and basically, the current state of the art is, uh, is nonlinear MPC with one of these models. And I would say most of the really good stuff is, uh, is really just using the, the dynamic bicycle model still. And we'll look at some of this stuff. So let's look at some, some crazy stuff. So this is uh, the lab I was mentioning, which is Chris Gertie's group uh, at Stanford. And this is their autonomous driving stuff. So this is autonomous racing around a track uh, with an Audi TT. This is from a, like five-ish years ago. Um, and uh, they race against human drivers all the time. And apparently they're basically, they're, they're better, they can routinely beat amateur uh, drivers, uh, like serious amateur drivers, uh, but they're, they're a little bit slower than like good pro drivers right now. And it's kind of for those reasons we were talking about, like these exploration kind of things that the humans are doing. Uh, so there's that, I don't know what's interesting. So yeah, I think like more or less what's going on here is nonlinear MPC, they have a model of the track, and they're doing, they're solving basically like a minimum time optimal control problem and uh, with a lot of tricks. And they do this actually, you can read their papers. Here's this paper. Uh, when I was at Stanford, I was a bunch of these guys, PhD committees. So I like kind of know what they're doing. Um, so you can, they, they literally solve these problems with IP opt. It's nonlinear direct collocation. Like we've talked about solve with IP opt. They run IP opt on the car at like 40 or 50 Hertz and that's it. It's like exactly the kind of stuff we've talked about in class. Yeah. So when you say you're using your time, is, they, is this as a constraint or as a variable the time of the, like to minimize the time, right? Yeah, so they wanna go around as fast as possible, right? So the objective is minimum time. So they're solving pretty much a minimum time optimization problem. So it's like the, we talked about how to do free final time, minimum time, make a DT's decision variables. This is kind of the thing that they're doing. Yeah. Basically they mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a bunch of tricks in exactly how they formulate the problem. Um, they have some tricks for like convexifying things and like, you know, similar things to some other things we've seen. But generally speaking, what they do is nonlinear MPC with collocation and IP ops, and it runs on the car. And that's, that's the story. So here's the more fun, version of this yeah you have some? okay so this is super fun this is yeah this is fantastic so this is like uh but yeah so this is autonomous drifting so this is now right like now you're reasoning about uh more sophisticated tire models right and more sophisticated like obviously there's slip here right so you're now having to reason about friction effects and like slipping and all this kind of crazy stuff but again nonlinear mpc and you can do this on the car, yeah. Uh, no. Uh, if you want to see how they do it, here it is. Yeah, I think this was, uh, when's this paper? I think this is maybe slightly more recent than this, but it's, uh, uh, what is this? I don't know, I have the year in here somewhere. Here it is, you have to do this. Uh, this was like two or three years ago. I think it was 2018, 2019 maybe. But yeah, here's the paper. Um, oh, this is older. Anyway, they have some more recent stuff too, but it's it's straight up MPC with like, it's actually a, a single track model. It's a dynamic bicycle model with tire friction models that are a little bit fancier that are approximating pool and friction and stuff. Uh, and that's that's it. Uh, they may be, there may be some more recent stuff that's doing some, some like, but this stuff, as far as I know, like that lab, like pretty much everything's nonlinear MPC. They're not doing much learning. Yeah. So when they're doing this like racing or drifting, they first have to make like a, like they, they first have to fit like the waypoint of like the race time, right? Yeah, they, so there's some amount of offline, like basically for the race track thing, they know the track. Exactly. And so there's just a model of the track. Exactly. Yeah. And they just try to track and optimize the race time to the track. Yeah. yeah, so I think in the, in the around the track stuff, I think they're basically just solving a minimum time trajectory problem given the track boundaries mm -hmm. uh, with some tricks. Right. Yeah. For the drifting, do they have like a trajectory that they plan around the cone? Uh, I think so, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's like a given path around the cones, but, um, and they're doing lots and lots of tricks in here. 
like as you might imagine, but the, the basic setup is like nonlinear MPC with some like kind of sophisticated low level tracking control stuff. Um, so you guys, should, I'll, I'll post the papers. You should check out the papers. Yeah. Um, for the for the racing, um, if you go and look at that, maybe like two weeks. If you go look at the actual control, like what did they apply? Does it end up looking like random control? Like, do you see if they just like full acceleration, full brake, full turn, full acceleration again, or is there more subtlety? There's more subtlety, yeah. And they're the stuff they're solving for. Their cost functions are a little bit fancier. They're not just minimum time. They're uh, in particular, because they're solving this like nonlinear, non-convex problem, like online, they do a bunch of relaxations of the constraints. Mm -hmm. So, like in all these like nonlinear optimization, the hard prop part are the con nonlinear constraints, right? So, um, in a lot of cases, they're relaxing the hard inequality constraints into like soft penalties. So it makes the problem easier to solve. And they're doing a bunch of massaging of the of the NLP to like make it nicer for IP op so they can solve it reliably online. Um, but yeah, they're straight up solving a non-convex triage problem online with a bunch of these relaxation tricks to make it kind of nicer. Uh, and they they have a safety fallback controller. So if the if IPOP barfs and doesn't return a solution fast enough, they have a fallback controller. But apparently from talking to them, they've literally never had to use it. So they've like tweaked out the problem formulation enough that it's it's reliable enough. There's a bunch of tricks. So one of the other fun tricks here is they use you know high fidelity model. Um, but if you rolled the high fidelity model out all the way, like the problem gets really huge. So one of the other tricks is you use the high fidelity model for like the first 10 time steps or something like this. And then the longer tail, you use like a point mass model or a simpler model uh, for the longer horizon. And that turns out like gets you a way smaller, easier to solve MPC problem without really any downside. Like it turns out as long as you have the high fidelity model for the first few time steps, you get everything you care about. And then you want that longer horizon to like see around the next turn, right? Uh, and set you up. So that's another fun trick. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Keep trucking. Yeah. Yeah. So you definitely could do some sort of, you know, like in this particular case, because it's a repetitive task. Like this is exactly the sort of thing where iterative learning control type approaches would be really good. Uh, they don't, haven't done that to my knowledge, but like, yeah, you could definitely do some amount of learning. The other thing that would like, as you were mentioning, is like parameter estimation kind of stuff where like the biggest one's the tire friction coefficient. Like knowledge of that is critical. And so like doing some amount of online exploration. The issue with the tire friction coefficient is you can't just do sysid on it like from a lap because the only way it becomes observable is if you slip. Right, like you only can see what it is once you're past it. So you need some kind of exploration strategy in the controller that's gonna push the system past the friction limit to even know where it is to estimate it, which is what the human driver does, right? Yeah. If you do sysid to look at how the human driver does that, like drifting, does it have to be the same kind of uh, like drift uh, behavior every single time? Not necessarily. Like if you did system identification, like model, fitting from that. I mean, you could like learn, fit a model and then do whatever you want with it, right? So this is why our like model-based control is a huge win over model-free approaches. Like it's because they generalize, right? So if I do model-based RL, model-based, whatever you want to call it, where I learn a model from a big data set. Now, given that model, I can do whatever I want, right? Uh, modulo, like staying within the region of state space where it was fit, right? So that I'm interpolating and not extrapolating, but yeah, like Whereas if you did some model free thing uh, where then it's really just dialed in for that specific task, right? So you can only ever kind of do the one thing. So model based techniques are usually a big win um, because of this, right? Uh, so often like with a model based control stack, you can like switch out the robot and like only have to tweak a few things and, and things will still work. It's kind of cool. Okay, any other questions about this stuff? Okay, cool. So let's uh, kind of, Keep tracking. Um, so yeah, basically all the stuff I just showed you, even the drifting was a dynamic bicycle model, which is kind of awesome. Uh, I'm terrible at writing and spelling right now. So dynamic bicycle model with good tire model. Uh, gets you really far. 
And I would say arguably like anything you want to do on the road, that's probably good enough. And like, you probably don't really need to do the double track stuff until you like start looking at crazy off road stuff. And those examples are all doing kind of like online MPC uh, with IP opt uh, at about 50 Hertz. And I'll, I'll post the papers on Piazza so you can check out the details. Okay, cool. So that's like more or less what is state of the art and what the car companies are actually doing is like, you know, in the MPC controller, some version of that. They're using like a bicycle model and like some flavor of nonlinear trad job. Um, at least the stuff I'm tent somewhat aware of, like the car companies are literally using ILQR variants uh, with a bicycle model in their MPC controllers. It's definitely stuff you guys have seen in here. Um, Brian, your TA, uh, may, may have some things to say about this. He uh, worked at an autonomous car company last summer and implemented a bunch of stuff in their driving stack uh, that he worked on in our lab. So he, he has some insight, I guess. Um, so that's kind of standard stuff. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to talk a bit about um, like one interesting and hard and still like unsolved kind of uh, part of the control problem for autonomous driving for specifically for like city and highway driving. Um, and this is the frozen robot problem. Who's heard of this? This number. Can someone give me a, a quick explanation of the frozen robot problem? Anyone? Yes, raise your hands. Yeah. You're, you're basically stuck in a scenario where like you don't know whether it's better to go right or left. Yeah. So. The, there's a particular instantiation of this with, yeah, that's like roughly it. In, in driving, there's some pretty specific examples of this that come up and it all has to do with like interactions with other cars. So yeah, it comes up when you have like a situation where there's no, where naively reasoning about collision constraints and this kind of stuff, like reason about I can't you know hit other cars, um, there's no feasible path for you. And where this shows up the most is in highway merging. So like if there's a bunch of traffic and traffic's really, they're like packed, and you're coming down the on-ramp onto the highway, there's no space big enough for you to merge in between the cars. Literally, the autonomous car will just hit the brakes and stop at the bottom of the ramp and just say, there's no feasible path for me to merge, that's it. And the reason is that if you're solving this MPC problem, you're basically treating the other cars as like deterministic, like static obstacles, basically, right? And what you're missing is being able to reason about coupled behavior between you and the other cars, the other drivers, right? And the fact that like what we intuitively do as human drivers is we get to the bottom of the ramp, we look at this, we're like, oh, there's no room. If I kind of nudge my way in there, uh, the other drivers don't want to hit me either. So they're going to make some space for me and let me in, right? So that's the part that's missing in like standard optimal control formulations. And we're going to talk about how to, how to deal with that a little bit. So here we go. Uh, we want the MPC controller to reason about um, coupled behavior with other drivers. So like the heart of this is like a kind of like, if I do this, the other, car will probably do that in response kind of stuff, right? Is what you want. So like reasoning about the impact your actions will have on the other car's future actions, right? Which does not happen most of the time. Uh, so what actually most of the current systems do for highway driving is assume that given what's, you know, what they see in the perception system, they basically assume that the other cars will continue driving at constant velocity over the MPC horizon. It's generally what they assume, uh, which is a really simple assumption, right? And it turns out is a pretty good assumption for highway driving, right? Like everyone's staying in their lane, going 65 miles an hour or whatever. And that's basically it. So that works pretty well for highway driving. Um, but obviously it breaks down in like city scenarios, merging scenarios, right?
Uh, and yeah, this sort of works well for highway driving. Uh, but breaks down in like more, I don't know, in scenarios with like tighter coupling between the cars. So like, uh, yeah, ramp merging. Okay. Um, yeah, and like I said, basically, if there's a um, a big enough, if there's not a big enough gap between the cars during merging, the MPC controller will just stop and say there's no safe path. Okay, so how do we fix this? Um, the answer, at least one answer, an answer that we've studied in my lab is um, uh, using game theory to get at this coupled reasoning about what the other driver is gonna do. And um, in particular, we, we've kind of done this formulation that um, is basically game theoretic MPC. So we'll kind of look at that. And you can sound fancy, so now you know what like a Nash game is, right? Okay, so the high level idea of like what goes on in this is you assume that, so rather than assume, you know, other cars are driving at constant velocity, blah, blah, blah. You assume that the other cars around you are solving an optimal control problem, just like you. So you basically say, okay, I'm solving this optimal control problem. I've got my car's dynamics, I've got a cost function, and I've got some collision constraints, right? Now you assume that all the other cars around you are solving the exact same problem and that they have the same collision constraints basically. And now there's coupling between your optimization problems through the collision constraints, right? So my collision constraints depend on you, your, so there's, so you write down all these separate optimal control problems for everybody. They're all coupled uh, through the collision constraints and you basically stack them up and solve them jointly together. So, uh, and that, that does very interesting things it turns out. So, solve a joint trajectory optimization problem. for all the cars simultaneously. Um, so we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit now and like I'll so show you what the setup for this looks like and then we'll talk to you a little bit. So one version of this uh, idea of, of like a dynamic game is um, so uh, there's, when you set up a problem like this, where you have all these different players, right? So here, each car is a player in the lingo of game theory. Um, it turns out there's multiple sort of definitions of optima you could think about. Um, so, and these are called equilibria in game theory, right? So here, we're gonna talk about a Nash equilibrium, which basically corresponds to everybody being like on an equal playing field. Like everybody has knows the same information and everybody's acting simultaneously. And there's nobody who has like uh, any like favored kind of thing going on. So everyone's more or less equal. There's other versions of games where you have like a leader and follower or like some players, there's information asymmetry between the players. This is like kind of the most maybe straightforward one. So the idea here is we're gonna define a, um, a giant state vector we'll call we'll call all these things bar so this is going to have um the states for each 
individual car stacked up. So like one through N cars. And then we'll do the same thing for the U's. We'll have a U bar that has all the controls for all the individual cars. Um, so here, state and input. Uh, for all cars stacked. Um, so now what we can do is for each individual car, we'll write down that car's trajectory optimization problem. So that's gonna look like min over X bar UI for car I. And then you have some cost function for car I that can in general depend on all the states of all the cars. So this is how you can get coupling like with collision avoidance, stuff like that. Um, and then it's only a function of car I's controls. And then we've got um, a giant set of dynamics constraints that we're gonna call capital D. This is gonna depend on everybody's states and controls. This equals zero. And then we've got a giant set of collision constraints, which are our inequalities, which will look something like this. Uh, we'll write it like this. So here's, so we've got cost for car I, and then dynamics and collision constraints. for all cars. Okay, so like this problem depends on the X's and U's for everybody, but I'm only optimizing over UI, right? Like the, the controls for car I here, right? And I have a specific cost function for car I that can encode things that are unique to car I, right? So you can imagine encoding things here about like driver aggressiveness, like uh, following distance, you know, desired highway driving speed, like that kind of stuff that could be particular to a, an individual driver that can go in that JI, right? But it depends on everybody else. So when we do this, we're gonna end up with N problems of this form, right? For cars one through N. So we get a uh, little N, i.e. number of cars uh, of these problems. that we have to solve simultaneously. That's kind of what's going on, right? Um, and like the kind of Nash equilibrium interpretation like is that um, basically that no player the definition of like in words of a Nash equilibrium is that no player can unilaterally improve their cost. So it's saying like, basically everyone's at kind of a stalemate is one interpretation of this, or it's saying like, you know, if it, like everyone's doing this at the same time and no one can do any better uh, on their own, right? Okay, uh, so this is actually a, this is a pretty good model of non-cooperative driving behavior, like normal driving with lots of drivers. And um, yeah, you can like shape the cost function to like, uh, model like um, driver behavior stuff. Okay, so cool. We wrote down the problem. Yeah. So is this a good way? I don't know if you said it. I'm sorry if I missed it to encode aggressive behavior. So like, for example, if you're, if you're like racing normally, like 
lasers have a very aggressive behavior with, with each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is this like doing this game theory thing, is this a good way to like encode that? Yeah, yeah. So that you could like imagine writing down cost functions that encode that kind of stuff uh, mathematically. So you, you have to think about this a little bit, what you want yeah, this to look like, but like yeah, but in principle, like that can go in that J. Okay, so now how do we solve this? This sounds hard. It's like a giant problem with like, basically it's N coupled copies of like the trajectory optimization problem where the constraints are all coupled together, right? Which seems pretty nasty. Um, so here's how we do it. And there's a paper and algorithm we have called Al Games. Um, And if you've noticed a theme from my lab, uh, it uses an augmented Lagrangian method to handle the constraints and basically like stacks all these problems together. So here's what we do. Um, we form an augmented Lagrangian for each player's um, Um, for each player's like first order necessary conditions. So here's what that looks like. So I'm going to get an augmented Lagrangian for each player. And that's going to look like here we'll do like LI, so player I. And it's a function of X bar, U bar, lambda I. Uh, so these are the Lagrange multipliers for the augmented Lagrange, and I'll explain this in a sec. So you're going to get the cost function for player i, which is a function of x bar, and then only the ui for that player. Then you're going to get the dynamics constraints. Um, so here's like standard augmented Lagrangian thing where we get the quadratic penalty term. So this would be the d dynamics constraints squared. Um, a Lagrange multiplier term on the dynamics constraints. So this is like the lambda uh, times D. Then we're going to get a, a penalty on the Cs. So uh, over to the same kind of deal. And this, we're going to use this plus notation to mean it's taking like the positive part of that it's only penalizing constraint violations, right? Um, hopefully that makes more sense if you go back and look at the augmented Lagrangian stuff we've done. And then this is Lagrange multiplier for the C constraints, the inequality constraints, collision constraints. So that's our augmented Lagrangian. So it's just standard Lagrange multiplier thing plus the penalty term, right, that we've done before. And now I can take the gradient of this guy with respect to UI, uh, and set it equal to zero. And that's my first order necessary conditions, right? For, uh, for an optimum for player I, right? So that's for each player. Now I can stack all of those for all N players. So stack first order necessary conditions for all players. So I'm going to get a whole bunch of these guys. So it's like grad U1, L1, grad U2, L2, dot, 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 grad U, N, L, N. And all those gradients have to equal zero. Now I have a giant root finding problem. So I can solve this with Newton's method. And then I can, uh, in this outer loop, so there I'm, I'm like basically minimizing each of these individual problems with respect to the U's, right? Now I can go and solve, uh, do the standard augmented Lagrangian outer loop updates on the Lagrange multipliers after I solve this thing. Uh, to get your lambdas and mu's. And then, um, yeah, I'll show you what this looks like. But yeah, basically, if you solve this to convergence, you get a Nash equilibrium uh, strategy for all the drivers. And you do MPC on this, you run the next control move for U, which, uh, you know, is player one maybe. 
And this can generate some like really kind of interesting like human-like interaction strategies. Um, and then like the story from our paper from doing this, uh, which I'll show you some videos from in a sec, is basically by like being really smart about how you implement the solver for this, uh, just like the games we've talked about uh, in the class, like um, that crazy stacked set of first order necessary conditions is a giant problem, but it's super sparse. As you can imagine, like for each individual pro sub problem, it's got like the standard you know band structure that we know about from class, and then the constraints. It's only coupled in the collision constraints between pairwise between cars. So that also has its own sparsity structure. So it turns out the like giant set of not exactly KKT conditions, but whatever, you know, that that giant linear system is that you have to solve in the Newton solver, tons of sparsity. So we write a kind of custom linear solver for that that exploits all the sparsity. And the punchline is we can do this at like 30 to 50 hertz for like four or five cars around you and, and solve it in real time. Yeah. Do you run into issues where you do a solve place to tasks, um, another car to do something that is just broken free and you either maintain some piece of your car so the other car does the thing that they yeah, so um, so I think one just note on like the wording, right? There, this is a non-cooperative, uh, aka like adversarial formulation. So it's not um, assuming there's any like benevolence on the part of other drivers, and you can bake that sort of stuff into the cost functions that you assign to the other drivers. So like, what you probably do in a real scenario is make those like super conservative, right? And make the collision constraints on you super conservative and like super not conservative and aggressive for everybody else and try to be like somewhat safe about this. But yeah, so what'll happen in certain, we're doing this in a receding horizon kind of set up at like 50 Hertz. Mm -hmm. So because we actually enforce hard collision constraints on us, we're still safe because like if they do something crazy, we're updating at 50 Hertz, we'll see them doing something crazy and we'll keep you know doing the receding horizon thing and adapt to whatever they do. So it's actually quite robust to the other drivers not obeying your model of them. Uh, like your kind of game theoretic model assumptions. Um, another thing, we, we had a follow-on paper uh, from this one that I'll show you where we actually tried to like estimate, uh, learn the cost parameters for the other drivers online while you watched them interact with them. And it turns out you can kind of get this to work, but because the interactions with the other cars are so like short and sparse in a standard driving scenario, the cost function stuff is mostly unobservable because there's just not that much data. So it turns out you can only estimate like maybe two or three cost weight kind of parameters. And um, and then to get a, a lot of those, you actually have to like get super close to the other car so that you're like kind of like exciting these collision interactions, right? So it's kind of sketchy. And so what you probably want in a real scenario is just like really strong conservative priors on like what everybody's doing, which I would argue is what we're doing, right? Like we're not really interacting with other cars in standard scenarios, like long enough or in enough depth to really know what they're, you know, going to behave like, we like heuristically assume a lot, and then like when someone does something crazy, maybe we, we're like whoa and, and kind of back off and don't go near them, right? And I think like roughly speaking, that's kind of what you want here. You want like a really strong prior with like very conservative stuff, and then like if you see something crazy that dramatically is outside of the like far away from the prior, then maybe you do something. Uh, so yeah. Um, you said since you're about 25 cars, you have to slow or That's very stupid. Um, is there a weirdness when cars kind of drop from the average of sets of cars that are being considered? Nah. No. It doesn't really matter. Like basically what we were doing is assuming you have some set of sensors and you're just looking at your neighbors, like your nearest neighbors or whatever. But yeah, that that really isn't a big deal. Um yeah, I mean the, the real challenge here is that problem is huge mm -hmm. and you need to figure out a way to solve it at real time rates. And like, that's the hard part. And we can scale it right now. Like the paper we have is, and also that wasn't like super aggressively dialed in. We got it to work with like, say four or five other cars, like kind of at these rates, no problem. And if you tried really hard and you did some parallelization and stuff, you could probably get it to scale up a little bit more. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's actually quite tractable for like highway driving stuff. Um, let me show you guys. We're kind of almost out of time. So, uh, Just write this down.
Okay, so fun like demo videos of this. Uh, it's from RSS, I don't know, it's 2020. Let's go. So this is, yeah, okay. So here's um, like showing like, I don't know, just waiting for the other car. And uh, we did a bunch of scenarios where we like had like random behaviors on the other agents. So they were definitely not following. Oh, this is getting into like other flavors of game theoretic equilibrium. We kind of just did the Nash thing here. Okay, yeah. So here's the classic like frozen robot issue. Uh, let's see if it'll work. Maybe I should actually put the sound on. So yeah, you have these little collision bubbles. Stay in the lane. Uh, this is like working. Okay, this is just doing the math out like I basically showed you. Uh, skip, skip, skip. This is the fun part. Okay, here's fun things. Lane changing, overtaking. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the interesting one. So you kind of reason that like you can force your way in between the other cars. And we have some like more fancy demos of this. All right, this is like a pedestrian, like that's not, you know, part of the game. It's just a constraint. Uh, this is like, works online most of the time <laughs> but that's this is like again that non-convex thing that we were talking about before right like that's still kind of bad like one in 200 times this is going to bark at you <laughs> online which you don't want right uh so oh this is like the frozen robot thing so this is like it just stops right because it doesn't think it can get between the other cars and just waits for everybody to pass so like that's what like a current MPC solution would do, right? And you can imagine if it's a really crowded highway, like it'll just not even do anything. And then uh, this setup, yeah, it'll actually like kind of nudge its way in between the other cars. Anyway, uh, I think that's kind of it. Yeah, oh, yeah. So in this case, like, uh... All the other cars are also running the same. Like they're actually here. They the are in these examples, but we've done lots of them where they're not. Like you can do model mismatch, right? By like basically making the other cars actually have different cost functions or whatever or collision constraints than what you are assuming, and it's still it's actually still pretty robust and still works. Um, uh, and yeah, like one of the, the deeper questions I have about this whole thing that I would really want to look into at some point is how legit is this? So what we're another way of saying what we're doing here is we're assuming all of the agents are rational i.e that they're individually solving some optimization problem to determine what they're doing and i really wonder how good of an assumption that is for humans like i'm not convinced that it is very good and actually a lot of economic theory says that it's a bad assumption for human behavior so um i'm super curious to what i want to do with this is actually basically like take a giant data set of like human driver behave like stuff which exists right and then try to fit this model class to the actual human driver data. Basically put in like a totally, a super descriptive black box function approximation for like the cost function in here and the constraint functions, whatever. And just like do black box fitting to see if we can fit this, like to see if this game Nash equilibrium thing actually describes you know, with arbitrary cost functions and whatever inside it is, is actually a good model for human driving behavior. Like, I don't know that it is, but, but it's a reasonable assumption. And it's like, these are these sort of models that people in economics use for like human behavior, but more recent work in economics in the last like 10 years or so has really started to poke at this and show that it's like, doesn't super well model humans in a lot of cases. Yeah, anyway, that's it. Happy to chat if you guys wanna hang out. <laughs>